Bon, ben merci à vous d'être là. Euh, donc on est heureux d'accueillir aujourd'hui euh, à l'école, il, il y a du monde au balcon, comme on dit, à la fois le, le directeur de, du CIAV, qui est le Centre international d'art verrier de Maisenthal, donc Yann Grinenberger, qui était déjà venu à l'école pour les journées d'études du labo. Euh, Maisenthal, avec, euh, que connaissent bien certains étudiants du, du labo, puisque deux, deux années de suite, euh, on a organisé deux workshops sur le, le verre et la céramique, 3D. Euh, également, on, accueille, euh, on est très heureux d'accueillir un groupe d'enseignants de la Central San Martins de Londres, euh, notamment euh, Mick Finch, qui est responsable du, du premier cycle donc, euh, à Londres, et euh, ce qu'on appelle des, des enseignants artistes-chercheurs. Euh, Mick vous expliquera euh, comment sont structurées les études dans les écoles, les écoles anglaises. Et euh, ensuite, on va organiser une série de très courtes interventions euh, chaque euh, enseignant, il y, en a, il y en a huit, présentera en cinq minutes euh, son travail de recherche. Euh, on accueille aussi euh, Julien Bézy, qui est euh, éditeur euh, donc les éditions Naïma, euh, sachant qu'après la, la conférence, euh, sur les deux ordinateurs qui sont à l'extérieur de, de l'amphi, euh, vous pourrez euh, voir donc la maquette du premier volume de la publication de, du, du laboratoire. Alors je vais céder la parole d'abord à Yann Grunenberger qui va, peut nous expliquer ce qu'est Maisenthal dans sa philosophie euh, du verre, euh, sa cohabitation avec l'industrie du luxe et comment ils ont réussi euh, en démarrant euh, sur, des, euh, sur des complicités, des amitiés, euh, un tout petit groupe d'amis qui sont penchés sur la transmission des savoirs et voilà, voyant les vieux verriers partir à la retraite, comment ils ont essayé de retenir ces savoirs, comment ils ont eu le culot d'inviter les plus grands artistes et designers euh, du moment pour essayer de constituer, de, de créer une plateforme de création verrière euh, et qui, 15 ans après, a débouché sur, un, je dirais, presque un nouveau modèle économique de la petite équipe de, de trois amis de départ. Maintenant, il, il est question d'un grand projet architectural euh, où, avec un musée, la plateforme de création verrière, une salle de concert, etc. Donc, Yann, à toi. Ben, merci à tous d'être venus. Alors effectivement, je vais vous parler un peu de, de ce projet un peu improbable, euh, avec une focale sur la moulothèque, puisque j'ai bien compris que euh, la conservation des outils était un peu à l'heure du jour euh, ces derniers temps. Donc je vais commencer rapidement par un historique, mais franchement, je vais aller à l'essentiel pour me concentrer un peu plus largement sur la, euh, la stratégie que l'on a employée pour sauvegarder des outils et leur donner une seconde vie. Simplement, rapidement, Maisenthal, hein, c'est au nord-est de la France, c'est en Moselle, dans le massif des Vosges du Nord. Euh, au XVIe siècle, il y a eu les premières implantations verrières euh, nomades qui se sont mises en place dans cette région, tout simplement parce qu'il y avait les ressources naturelles, les ressources du sol qui permettaient de mettre en œuvre le matériau vert, donc du sable que l'on puisait au fond de, des lits des rivières, mais également du bois à profusion pour pouvoir porter à fusion ce sable à 1600 degrés pour le transformer en verre. On peut le transformer en verre à 1400 degrés en y ajoutant des cendres de fougères et de bruyères qu'allaient euh, récolter les, les dames et les enfants en forêt. Dès que les verriers nomades avaient brûlé le bois à 1 km, 2 km, 3 km autour de ces petits fours de fortune, et qu'il était trop compliqué d'aller chercher le bois et le ramener au four, ben, il était plus simple de déplacer le four dans une vallée voisine, et on a des implantations comme ça pendant plus de 200 à 300 ans dans les Vosges du Nord. Et en 1704, première implantation sédentaire dans un fond de vallée à Maisenthal, les voies sont plus carrossables, les moyens de transport un peu plus sérieux, et on peut tranquillement commencer à acheminer les matières premières dans une usine en dur et y faire de la production de masse. Maisenthal est une structure qui a vécu une épopée industrielle assez incroyable. Euh, juste pour vous situer, à 5 km, il y a la cristallerie de Saint-Louis, la verrerie de Götzenbrück, la cristallerie Lalique, la, la cristallerie de Lemberg, etc. Donc on est vraiment sur quelques vallées mitoyennes qui concentrent énormément d'activités verrières. Maisenthal s'est surtout spécialisé dans ce qu'on appelle la gobeletterie bon marché, le verre usuel de tous les jours, des mieliers, des beurriers, des plats à tarte, des services de table, et a connu néanmoins 27 années un peu folles, entre 1867 et 1894, 
années durant lesquelles Émile Gallet a fait ses armes à Meisenthal. Et c'est pour ça qu'on dit encore aujourd'hui que Meisenthal est le berceau du verre Art Nouveau. Donc Meisenthal va se lancer dans de la production de masse, d'une entreprise qui va avoir jusqu'à 650 salariés dans les années 1920-1930. Sur le bassin d'emploi, c'est plus de 5000 personnes qui travaillent autour des métiers verriers. L'unité de production traverse difficilement les conflits mondiaux et malheureusement, à la fin des années 60, vient s'échouer parce que ben, apparaissent tout simplement les, les unités de production verrières mécanisées en Tchécoslovaquie, Belgique, Allemagne. Et pendant qu'un sympathique verrier soufflait un verre à bière, il y a une machine qui en faisait 10. Et donc le client euh, final choisissait tout simplement le moins cher. Et les patrons d'alors n'ont pas eu le, le courage, des moyens ou l'envie de moderniser l'outil de production et, et préfèrent fermer l'unité de production le 31 décembre 1969 avec encore 230 salariés. C'est une époque de plein emploi. Il y a beaucoup d'industries qui s'implantent en proche Allemagne. Les usines de Saint-Louis, Lalique sont florissantes à côté. Donc c'est une petite mort assez anonyme et euh, qui passe euh, sans aucun conflit social particulier. Simplement, ce reste au milieu d'un village, une friche industrielle d'un hectare euh, qui euh, pose rapidement des sou soucis urbanistiques. Le drame aussi, hein, mais c'est un drame qu'on peut mesurer aujourd'hui avec euh, le recul, c'est que euh, lorsque l'unité de production de cet acabit ferme, ben, les patrons ont, ont, ont l'envie d'optimiser de, de, encore les, derniers, les dernières euh, possibilités de faire fructifier euh, l'outil et vendent à la ferraille plus de 8000 moules en métal, soit euh, quasiment 300 ans de mémoire de forme de Meisenthal. Heureusement euh, qu'il y a des érudits locaux, des amoureux du patrimoine qui, dans un des bâtiments les moins affectés, commencent à organiser des premières expositions temporaires à la fin des années 70, qui se transformera en musée du verre, qui existe encore aujourd'hui, qui raconte l'épopée de Meisenthal, l'extraordinaire aventure d'Émile Gallet et qui est gérée par une association qui accueille les, les, les visiteurs euh, 8 mois sur 12 euh, tout au long de l'année. À la fin des années 90, après plusieurs dizaines d'années de, de, de tests et de préfiguration, une association se monte autour de la Grande Halle. C'est une halle verrière de 3200 mètres carrés. Une halle qui fait sensiblement un terrain de foot couvert, 40 mètres x 80, avec d'anciens fours. Et une association qui, aujourd'hui, a six salariés. Il, fait, il programme des festivals de théâtre de rue, des résidences d'artistes, de danse contemporaine et des concerts. Et enfin, le centre d'art verrier, que je dirige depuis 2001, est un lieu qui a été euh, initié par des élus locaux, des amoureux du patrimoine et des artistes, dans l'ambition à la fois de sauvegarder le savoir-faire traditionnel verrier propre à ce territoire, mais surtout aussi de le remettre en culture en invitant des créateurs contemporains à puiser dans la boîte à outils de ces techniques anciennes pour essayer de réaliser des objets, des œuvres, des installations euh, qui font partie et qui répondent à notre époque. Et on a aussi l'ambition de partager ce travail avec le plus grand nombre par des expositions, euh, des, des éditions d'objets, des parutions, euh, etc. On a une équipe de 17 salariés, dont 8 verriers, qui au quotidien animent, animent ce lieu. Des verriers qui sont parfois euh, héritiers d'un savoir-faire euh, séculaire à, à saint louis les Beach ou chez la LIC. Euh, on a un verrier qui est maître d'art, un verrier qui est meilleur ouvrier de France et beaucoup de, de jeunes aspirants verriers qui sont, font partie de l'équipe et qui au quotidien s'en enrichissent leur euh, méthode de travail au contact des, des maîtres. Alors très rapidement, et, et là je vais venir plus, plus particulièrement au sujet de la, de la conférence, c'est les savoir-faire et les outils associés. Dès le milieu des années 90, une des grosses missions du centre d'art verrier a été de réunir des vétérans verriers, euh, des verriers issus de toutes les, les usines locales qui en général partaient avec, euh, en faisant un bras d'honneur ou avec un peu de... Euh, pas forcément dans les meilleurs termes parce que travailler pendant 40 ans dans une unité de production euh, 
si sympathique soit-elle, mais où le travail séquencé est quand même incroyable, euh, c'est pas facile. Et nous, on a créé un cadre euh, vertueux, un cadre sympathique dans lequel on a invité ces verriers euh, sur plusieurs soirées, euh, avec un repas, avec du bon vin rouge, euh, sans aucune obligation de, euh, de productivité, mais simplement euh, pour transmettre euh, des savoir-faire. Alors, il y avait des soirées dont la thématique était une technique, un objet, un moule. Euh, et, et là, d'homme à homme, au fond de l'atelier, parfois avec du public, comme sur cette photo, ben on a invité les anciens verriers à transmettre leurs CNIF. Dans le patois local, les CNIF, c'est des petits coups de patte, c'est ces choses qui ne se dessinent pas, qui ne se filment pas, mais qui se transmettent d'homme à homme. Alors, en quelques mots, avant de venir sur la partie euh, moulothèque, en deux minutes, même pas les principes génériques de, de mise en œuvre du verre, donc euh, le verre, c'est une matière en fusion euh, qui fusionne la nuit à 1350 degrés, qui se transforme en un espèce de miel incandescent que l'on vient prélever avec des cannes de soufflage, un peu comme euh, euh, du miel au bout d'une cuillère, on tourne, on tourne, et on peut euh, ce verre euh, le souffler et lui apporter euh, diverses euh, contraintes, soit avec des outils très rustiques, des ferrets, des fers, des ciseaux, des palettes en bois, des, des maillots en merisier ou euh, contraint de, euh, le verre en le soufflant dans un moule. Et là, on rentre véritablement dans vraiment l'aventure industrielle de toutes nos vallées, c'est la reproduction euh, à, en grand, à grande échelle, la production de masse euh, du, du verre. Vous savez, les artisans euh, verriers qui font du verre soufflé, des petites pièces euh, à façon unique, colorée, c'est une manière de, de, de faire exprimer cette matière dans nos vallées, c'était des industries lourdes. Euh, Maisenthal, 650 salariés. La Verrique Götzenbrück, 1700 salariés. Saint-Louis, 1200 salariés. C'était vraiment des vallées entières qui euh, produisaient des millions et des millions de pièces par an. Et donc, pour ce faire, il faut utiliser des outils qui ont la capacité d'absorber cette euh, production de masse. Alors, je vous passe les détails. Il existe diverses typologies de moules, des moules optiques, des moules pressés, etc. Mais on va se concentrer sur deux typologies de moules bien particuliers. Le premier, c'est le moule euh, soufflé-tourné, c'est-à-dire que le verrier surplombe un moule en, en métal ou en bois. Il est ouvert par un, ce qu'on appelle un gamin, parce qu'à l'époque, c'était les enfants qui faisaient ce travail. Aujourd'hui, on a des petites machines qui s'appellent les gamins mécaniques, plus besoin d'êtres humains euh, pour faire cette tâche. On souffle, on souffle dans le verre, le verre adhère aux parois et en même temps, on tourne la canne, ce qui permet euh, d'annuler le plan de joint dans la forme. Vous voyez là la photo en l'occurrence, c'est un moule en bois. Alors, la, la, cette technique peut être appliquée avec des moules en bois ou des moules en métal. Évidemment, le moule en bois a une durée de vie de 100 à 150 pièces. Son avantage immense est qu'il ne coûte pas cher du tout. Euh, et on peut également, évidemment, souffler de cette manière dans des moules en métal qui sont, euh, si on ne passe pas dessus avec un caterpillar, indestructibles. Et l'autre technique, c'est ce qu'on appelle le soufflet fixe. Je vous ai pris un petit exemple de la Madone. C'est une petite Madone éditée euh, qu'on a rééditée, qui est, fait partie de l'art euh, populaire local. Madone, mère à l'enfant. Et donc là, vous imaginez bien qu'on ne peut pas tourner la canne au risque de faire souffrir euh, la Sainte Marie. Donc là, c'est du soufflet fixe. Donc on surplombe le moule, on souffle très fort, soit avec des pistons, soit à la bouche. Et le verre vient se coller aux parois et donne la forme à l'objet. Et là, forcément, on a des plans de joint qui sont marqués. En général, c'est judicieusement euh, là euh, inséminé dans le drapé de, de la Madone, ou parfois c'est un peu moins facile à cacher. Alors des moules, hein, dès le début de l'existence du musée du verre, on en avait une trentaine, des moules à vertu pédagogique, didactique, permettant d'expliquer de, aux, aux enfants, aux visiteurs, bah, les techniques de production de masse telles qu'on les pratiquait à Maisnetal. Parce qu'il faut savoir aussi que à l'époque, on disait que pour un verrier qui soufflait du verre, il y avait dix métiers euh, joints. Il y avait les moulistes, il y avait les, les, les menuisiers qui fabriquaient les caisses pour l'export du verre, des paysans qui faisaient de la paille pour conditionner ce verre. On n'avait pas de papier bulle à l'époque. Donc les moulistes, c'est aussi toute une, toute une filière économique locale qui a perduré pendant des années et des années. Alors nous, au début de l'existence du centre d'art verrier, on avait 3-4 moules en bois. On travaillait surtout les premiers workshops avec les étudiants italiens, espagnols. C'était du, 
soufflé libre avec des verriers tchèques qui venaient nous donner un coup de main. Donc c'était plutôt ce qu'on appelle le verre à la volée avec des outils, mais sans se concentrer particulièrement sur les moules. Et en 1998, on a eu une opportunité, c'est que la verrerie, la cristallerie Lorraine pardon, de Lemberg, à 5 km de Maisenthal, ferme ses portes. C'est une unité de production qui a démarré en 1924 et euh, je m'autorise à vous raconter en 23 secondes comment est née cette verrerie parce que c'est assez incroyable. C'est un boulanger, M. Heitzmann, Théodore Heitzmann, qui est boulanger pour les cristalleries de Saint-Louis et qui tous les matins livre du pain pour les verriers de, de Saint-Louis. Et un jour, Saint-Louis lui dit, écoute, on va arrêter, on va fabriquer notre propre pain dans la cristallerie, ça nous coûtera moins cher. Et il a été vexé et il a dit, moi, je vais créer ma propre cristallerie, ce qu'il a fait dans le village voisin. Donc voilà, parfois, sur un malentendu comme ça, on peut voir émerger des aventures industrielles incroyables. Donc, malheureusement, tout comme Maisenthal, hein, comme c'est une unité de production qui ne s'est pas spécialisée dans le niche haut de gamme, de luxe, mais qui fabriquait de la verrerie euh, bon marché, de la gobeletterie usuelle euh, quotidienne. Pareil, elle, elle s'échoue à la fin des années 90. Et là, on a une chance parce que euh, le CIAV existe depuis presque 10 ans. On se dit que ce serait bien d'avoir quelques moules et on apprend que dans la vente ultime des biens de cette unité de production, il y a des moules. On fait jouer avec le député local le droit de préemption et on acquiert pour... Euh, 10 000 francs à l'époque, euh, l'intégralité de la moulerie. La moulerie, c'est le lieu où sont entreposés euh, tous les moules. Euh, on y va, je me rappelle, j'étais jeune et vaillant. Euh, on y va avec des camionnettes, plusieurs jours. Le temps de prendre un repas au, au bistrot du coin, les ferrailleurs euh, piquaient des moules. Donc on a fait tout ce qu'on a pu. On a récupéré à peu près 850 moules en métal et près de 500 moules en bois. Et on était assez fiers parce que euh, parce qu'on avait des outils désormais, on a aussi une chance c'est qu'on a de la place sur le site Verrine de Maisenthal euh, ça pèse des tonnes et des tonnes, ça prend beaucoup de place c'est très lourd, c'est très compliqué nous on a de la place à Maisenthal, ça tombe bien donc euh, très rapidement euh, on se dit que c'est une manière de sauvegarder le patrimoine euh, mais c'est aussi euh, on nourrit à cette époque l'idée de réutiliser ces moules parce qu'un bah, moule en métal, avec un peu d'entretien, il, il fonctionne toujours. Malheureusement, quand vous avez un tas de moules comme ça, sur des, des mètres carrés, des mètres carrés, c'est très compliqué de, de, de trouver la bonne forme, etc. Donc on se met en tête, avec l'embauche d'un objecteur de conscience en, en l'an 2000, de créer euh, une pre, un premier inventaire de, de ces moules, principalement les, les moules en, en, en métal. Et donc, on fait une petite fiche qu'on travaille avec une conservatrice du patrimoine du département de la Moselle. Et bon an, mal an, on, on remplit la petite fiche d'identité euh, de ces moules euh, de manière très rustique, hein, même voire euh, rupestre, comme dirait l'autre. On prend un crayon de papier, on dessine le bord euh, des tranches des moules, on applique une feuille de papier, ça fait une empreinte, on redessine dessus. Vous voyez un peu les, les, pro, les profils qui ont été générés. Alors, ce n'est pas très exact. Mais ça permet d'avoir une première approche de ces formes. Euh, et on fait des gros classeurs, des énormes classeurs avec des A4, des A3. Et on est numéro de ça de 1 à 814. Et on a dans l'atelier ces énormes classeurs euh, qui servent euh, pour les designers, les artistes, lorsqu'ils veulent repérer une forme. Mais vous voyez, hein, le classement tel qu'il est fait là, c'est un petit classement préventif, mais très compliqué hein, de, de, de reclasser ça par typologie de forme, par taille, etc. Mais c'était un premier inventaire qu'on qu a mis en œuvre. Évidemment, on, on se croyait malin à l'époque, alors on a mis des belles petites étiquettes, etc. Mais bien sûr, on s'est vite rendu compte que lorsqu'on utilisait les moules, ben les étiquettes nous gênaient, on les enlevait, on les remettait, on les enlevait, et tout à coup, on les perdait, on n'avait plus le numéro du moule, mais bon, voilà. Donc on a acheté un feutre spécial blanc qui, qui résiste à la haute température, et on a renuméroté euh, tous nos moules. Alors autant pour la moulothèque en métal, des moules en métal, c'est pas compliqué, hein le bon sens paysan, les moules très lourds en bas, les moules légers en haut, voilà, ça c'est euh, plutôt euh, malin. Et puis les moules en bois, on a des caves voûtées sur le site de l'ancienne verrerie. Les moules en bois, ils souffrent de la chaleur, donc il faut les stocker à l'humidité dans, dans des endroits euh, euh, plutôt peu éclairés. Et donc on, on investit ces caves, euh, on ne fait pas du roquefort, mais on, on, on stocke nos moules en bois. Et très rapidement, c'est devenu euh, euh, 
un outil incroyable. Aujourd'hui, euh, je crois que ce qui signe véritablement l'action du centre d'art verrier, c'est évidemment hein, le travail avec des designers contemporains, des artistes plasticiens, des écoles d'art, des étudiants, des danseurs et j'en passe. Mais c'est surtout euh, cet ancrage euh, technique grâce à cette moulothèque qui sert euh, quasiment tous les jours. Euh, Lorsqu'un designer vient ou un artiste, un des premiers passages obligés, c'est la moulothèque. C'est une émotion, vous allez voir dans cette moulothèque, vous ouvrez les moules, vous découvrez comme un petit trésor les formes qu'elles peuvent générer, euh, vous les dessinez, vous, vous travaillez, vous devenez amoureux d'un moule, etc. C'est vraiment euh, euh, un process qui, euh, qui est très important et qui fait partie vraiment du, euh, du protocole. Euh, pour les étudiants, certains d'entre vous étaient, étaient chez nous, mais pour les étudiants des 25 écoles à travers l'Europe qui sont déjà venus chez nous, ben, ça structure une pensée parce que arriver dans un atelier un lundi matin, un atelier verrier, n'avoir jamais vu de la mise en œuvre derrière et dire OK, faites-nous un projet, c'est juste impossible. Donc nous, on a tout un protocole où pendant une demi-journée, on, on, on fait ce qu'on appelle une phase immersive avec les verriers. Bernard, le, le directeur artistique, où on explique un peu le, le solfège sur lequel on peut se pen, pencher pour, pour, pour travailler, écrire les, les, des histoires d'objets. Et rapidement, soit en, en amont avec les enseignants, soit sur place, on fait des présélections de moules. Ça structure la pensée, c'est un peu la page blanche qui permet au moins d'avoir un cadre. Et le verre est tellement compliqué que euh, bien rapidement, on se rend compte que c'est très intéressant d'être par, parti euh, euh, d'une forme euh, initiale. Là, je vous ai fait une petite présélection rapide de quelques objets qui ont convoqué la moulothèque et les, et les moules... Euh, qui sont principalement, vous l'avez compris, des contenants d'art de la table, des vases, des, des, des bénitiers parfois, des verres, des paraisons de, de services de verre, des carafas décantés. Ça, c'est Younes Ramoun, un artiste marocain qui a conçu pour le musée Mataf de Doha au Qatar euh, 77 lampes qui représentent les 77 recommandations du Coran. Et ces 77 lampes donc, euh, sont fabriquées essentiellement sur la base de moules anciens qui ont été réinterprétés avec des collages de, de pétales. Ces 77 lampes ont été montrées l'an dernier à l'Institut du Monde Arabe. D'autres exemples, Fred Riffel euh, en haut à gauche. Donc, euh, le Flox, c'est un vase que l'on peut emmener dans le jardin à la manière d'un petit sac, puisqu'il a, grâce à deux découpes très malines, euh, on peut créer une, une poignée, euh, l'appréhension de l'objet. Donc, c'est une espèce de gélule qui était un moule de dont ne sait quoi, qui, a, euh, qui vit une seconde jeunesse. Andreas Brandolini, en dessous, qui recycle des, des carafes à whisky qui étaient richement décorées euh, par le passé, et qui en fait un vase, qu'il a appelé demoiselle. Tout simplement, euh, vous avez vu la, les formes généreuses de ces petites demoiselles de verre. Euh, et euh, bah, une relecture plutôt sur la couleur et, et une interprétation sur le nom de l'objet. David Dubois, à droite, recycle deux formes et fait une, une confrontation un peu insolite entre un vase assez grand et un moule destiné à faire un verre à eau qui devient tout à coup à bas jour. Parce que ce que je ne vous ai pas dit, c'est que un moule, une fois qu'on souffle du verre dans un moule, il existe derrière 100 ou 150 techniques plus ou moins académiques pour changer la forme de, de l'objet que l'on a soufflé ou sa destination. On peut y intervenir à froid, en rognant, c'est-à-dire en découpant avec des ciseaux. On peut faire des rajouts denses, euh, des, des apports de verre. On peut le, le brûler, on peut greffer une autre pièce à chaud, on peut ajouter une petite attache. À froid, on peut le découper, le décaloter, le percer, le sabler, le décorer, l'émailler, l'argenter. Donc, en, quand on allie toutes ces combinaisons possibles, à partir d'un moule, on peut faire 150 objets différents. On n'est pas dans la contrainte de de réitérer exactement euh, ce, que, ce à quoi des, était destiné le moule d'origine. Françoise Cardon, aussi une, une, une artiste française, qui prend simplement euh, dans sa série Les Crâneuses, euh, qui comporte aussi une coupe à fruits, bah, qui prend une carafe traditionnelle à décanter et grâce à une technique euh, de soufflage sur du, du plâtre réfractaire qui, qui peut être recuit avec le verre et, et gratté euh, dans, dans une seconde phase, créer une, une insémination d'un un crâne euh, au sein de la pièce. À gauche, Werner Esslinger, un designer euh, allemand qui tout simplement prend un moule ancien, le chemise à l'intérieur avec de, de la fibre de verre, elle se contorsionne, elle se plie et on a tout à coup un décor assez improbable et à chaque fois unique 
qui est donné euh, à la surface du verre et qui est révélé aussi par une argenture intérieure après qui, qui en fait une pièce magnifique. Régis Maillot, euh, bah lui, il est rentré dans la moulothèque. C'est le premier qui n'a pas ouvert les moules pour regarder ce qu'il y a à l'intérieur. Il est tombé amoureux, fou amoureux de la forme des moules, de cette forme mécanique un peu improbable. Et donc, il a fait des moules, des moules, des moules au sable, d'abord chez un fondeur. On a fait des séries prototypes qu'on a montrées au Musée des Arts Décoratifs à l'occasion des Designer Days. Et puis là, on a édité, euh, on a fait faire trois moules de moules. Et donc, ça, c'est la série Jeanne et compagnie, parce que la pièce violette à droite, euh, on ne le voit pas sur la photo, mais on, on voit qu'il y a marqué Jeanne dessus, parce que sur les moules, il y a beaucoup d'inscriptions. Et c'était le moule du vinaigrier du service Jeanne de la cristallerie Lorraine de Lemberg. Voilà une manière aussi de réinterpréter les moules. Pareil, hein, un, un moule qui servait à faire un, un petit verre à cocktail qui, par le biais du, de l'ingéniosité d'Andreas Brandolini, devient euh, une boule de Noël. Ben là, on a aussi découvert... J'ai encore cinq minutes. OK. On a découvert aussi euh, les, 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 la pi les pièces à gauche sur le socle qu que certains moules étaient réversibles. Ils n'étaient pas destinés à ça, mais souvent, des moules sont... Euh, il y a un trou euh, dans la partie basse qu'on met sur une, une plaque en métal et du coup en, en inversant le moule on peut faire des pièces complémentaires et donc ça par exemple c'est quelque chose qui n'était pas inscrit dans notre première base de données qu'on a fait dans la seconde à droite des pièces qui sont issues de, de, de l'assemblage de moules euh, donc avec des formes un peu improbables de, deux formes toutes simples qui lorsqu'elles sont greffées et décalotées euh, euh, créées, euh, créées par les V8 donnent le verre collision donc, qui est euh, la collision entre deux, deux masses de verre soufflées dans, dans des moules. Et aussi, ben, je passe et des meilleurs. Hein, le verre peut être, euh, peut être décoré, peut être, vous voyez en haut à droite, et c'était le sujet de workshop avec Limoges, peut être euh, augmenté hein, de pièces en bois, en impression 3D, en céramique, et, et j'en passe. Donc la moulothèque, vous la voyez, là, elle est euh, avec les numéros en, en, en feutre blanc. Là, on était assez fiers. Et grâce à un partenariat avec l'école d'art de Valenciennes, où travaillait Michel à l'époque, ben on, on s'est mis en tête de numériser la moulothèque. Donc 814 moules ont été numérisés à partir des dessins donc, que je vous ai montrés tout à l'heure, les, les dessins un peu, un peu euh, euh, comment on pourrait dire ça, à 95%. Donc la chance aussi de tous ces moules, ce sont des formes de révolution. Donc à partir du moment où on fait un profil, on fait tourner sur soi-même et on a la forme du moule. Là, on a fait... On a fait pas mal de parti pris. Euh, on a décidé euh, de visuellement, en, en bleu, euh, décaloter ou couper la pièce comme on, on la verrait lorsqu'elle est produite en verre. Dans la seconde mouture, on, on, on va faire en sorte que ces, ces profils aillent jusqu'en haut pour pouvoir exploiter euh, toute la pièce. Et vous voyez en haut hein, qu'en inséminant des hauteurs et diamètres minimal et maximal, maximaux, on peut avoir une... une une suggestion de pièces et pouvoir accéder à la moulothèque et aller faire des prototypes ou réinterpréter ces pièces. On a eu pas mal euh, de chance parce qu'entre temps, on a récupéré 400 moules à l'entreprise allemande Villeroy et Bor. On a récupéré 400 moules à la cristallerie d'Artsviller. On, eu, euh, on a acheté chez un antiquaire 15 moules anciens de Maisenthal. Et donc, on a relancé euh, l'année dernière une campagne de numérisation en y inséminant de nouveaux champs, parce que euh, la première mouture était très, euh, très euh, spartiate, la deuxième mouture sera un peu plus complète. On va parler de la réversibilité possible des formes, euh, le marquage d'origine, j'en parle en 20 secondes. Sur les moules, comme c'est en fonte, il y a du marquage du nom du service euh, du moule, Koenig, Monaco, etc. Et pour le moment, il est impossible de reconstituer des familles. Euh, pas de rapprochement familial possible, si ce n'est un jeu de piste incroyable pour aller euh, trouver les moules. Grâce à la nouvelle base de données, on renseignera les noms d'origine de chaque moule et on pourra reconstituer tout ou partie de collection. Et un artiste, par exemple, va peut-être cliquer simplement sur euh, le service Versailles, ça va le faire rêver, il va bosser sur Versailles parce que Versailles va, va lui parler. On va aussi renseigner l'état du moule parce qu'on a beau dire que le, le moule 666 est... Et, et, et celui qu'il nous faudrait sauf que quand on va le chercher et qu'il ne fonctionne pas on est un peu embêté donc là aussi une nouvelle base de données on renseigne l'état du moule pour pouvoir investir éventuellement plus tard dans de la réflexion ou de, le, de, la, de la maintenance et on aimerait aussi que cette nouvelle base de données on puisse répertorier tous les projets contemporains 
euh, fait à partir de ces moules. Par exemple, le moule 1232, ce serait bien de savoir que un tel en a fait ça, un tel en a fait ça, et pouvoir renseigner une base de données. Alors, grâce à un partenariat avec les Goldards de Nancy et un stagiaire, ben, on a remis en place tout un protocole, nettoyage du moule, euh, euh, fiche d'identité qui permet d'avoir de, de, l'intégralité des informations sur le moule. Ensuite, photo numérique, donc on n'y va plus au crayon de papier et à la feuille A3, photo numérique, euh, profil, illustrator et, euh, et SolidWorks, ce qui nous permet euh, véritablement d'aller d'être beaucoup plus précis dans la numérisation des formes. Ça, c'est tous les différents items qui sont renseignés, dont je viens de vous parler, les techniques de soufflage, la hauteur, la largeur, l'inscription d'origine sur le moule, l'état du moule, etc. Et puis aussi, une nouveauté, euh, grâce à, à des historiens locaux et au musée du verre, on a retrouvé aussi un certain nombre d'informations sur les catalogues d'origine, euh, d'où sont issus ces moules. Et donc, on peut aussi rattacher les catalogues des anciennes productions, les anciens profils, etc., afin de, de créer une base de données beaucoup plus euh, ergonomique, toujours consultable euh, sur le net. Je veux rappeler aussi que ça ne permet pas de souffler du verre dans son salon, c'est simplement une, une base de données, un outil de travail qui permet de rentrer dans, dans les formes, mais rien ne, euh, on ne s'affranchira jamais de venir sur place, vivre l'instant avec les verriers et expérimenter avec eux. Et donc, euh, bah, ce qui va nous arriver, c'est ce que Michel a, a dit tout à l'heure. On a un énorme projet d'investissement qui va durer trois ans de chantier qui commence au début de l'année prochaine. Notre moulothèque, le bâtiment qui abrite nos moules va être détruit. Donc, il va falloir qu'on qu euh, déménage la moulothèque, <coughs> qu'on la rende beaucoup plus euh, maline, accessible, ergonomique, avec des outils pour pouvoir faire la réfection des moules, etc. Et on s'interroge encore aujourd'hui sur, euh, sur tout ce qui va falloir mettre en œuvre pour que ce, ce projet euh, de moulothèque continue à exister. Donc vous voyez que à partir du patrimoine, de la mémoire euh, technique, euh, du patrimoine matériel, qui induit du patrimoine immatériel, des savoir-faire, si tant est qu'on se donne la peine de, de conserver ce patrimoine et, et d'en faire un terrain de jeu pour des créateurs contemporains, mais il y a la possibilité simplement de ne pas s'inventer des légitimités traditionnelles euh, comme c'est le faire le, les, les, les grandes entreprises façon grand-mère depuis 1895 et je te mets un petit torchon rouge autour du jambon et là euh, c'est une manière très terre à terre de, de simplement euh, ne rien inventer mais essayer juste de continuer l'histoire dont on a été héritier voilà qu'il faut retenir en raccourci de cette histoire, c'est que c'est euh, dans le fond le, le plaisir d'inviter la convivialité du lieu qui mène quand même à des projets architecturaux de, de ce type là. C'est bien le plaisir de faire de l'art. Avant tout, il faut toujours se le rappeler, dans les écoles d'art, c'est sans doute ce qu'il faut se dire tous les jours, c'est qu'on peut bénéficier d'outils formidables comme cette école, d'ateliers formidables et toujours parler de plaisir de faire des choses, plus qu'autre chose, peut-être plus que de concepts ou de théories et, et d'amitié. Mick va vous faire une présentation de saint martin donc on, on change d'univers. Et il vous présentera ensuite l'équipe d'enseignants et les, les différents projets de recherche. Il faut noter que les chercheurs par, parleront en anglais, sauf Mick qui parle bien français. Oui, de la manière vache espagnole, mais euh, j'espère que euh, vous pouvez suivre. Bon, euh, juste pour dire un grand merci à toute l'équipe, euh, Jeanne et Michel, euh, pour l'accueil ici. Parce qu'on est ici pour, euh, comme on dit, faire un réparage d'un projet. Comme ça, euh, on a été invité ce soir, de, moi, en premier, moi je suis Mick Finch, je, je suis euh, le chef euh, de le premier cycle. De fine art, on dit art, euh, section art plastique. Mais bon, rapidement, qu'est-ce que, de, de, qu que j'ai fait J'ai fait juste une présentation. Comment ça marche la recherche dans l'école euh, à St. Martin's à Londres Et après, c'est juste pour dire, on a sept présentations de profs, outre, outre rapide, en anglais, mais il faut être très attentif. Et, mais en fait, on a essayé de euh, faire, le, comment on dit, le caption, le, 
le truc comme ça en français. Comme ça, j'espère que vous pouvez suivre comme ça. Mais après, la possibilité pour la question. Et euh, bon, rapidement, qu'est-ce que je fais C'est une présentation de l'école. En fait, chaque image, c'est une image de, de travail de, des étudiants, ou peut-être le prof de l'école. Voilà, en premier l'école. En fait, ça, c'est un euh, travail d'un euh, étudiant de, de deuxième cycle, Louise Minkin, elle est la chef de ça, elle est plus tard. Mais bon, on a. Bon, c'est une autre échelle, mais ce n'est pas pour dire que c'est mieux que les écoles qui ont une autre échelle euh, plus petite. C'est juste différent. On a 4500 étudiants, mais c'est un monstre, oui. C'est un monstre euh, qui, qui est là, au milieu de Londres. Mais en fait, ça, c'est une image de, de, de Grisha. On a dit à la fin de la, des études, il fait un, une exposition de tous le, 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 les étudiants qui diplôment. Juste pour dire, parce que c'est 4500 étudiants dans l'école, dans la section d'art, de BA, licence, on a 600. Comme ça, il est presque chaque année euh, dans le Fine Arts, il est um, 1080, non pas 1000, non, 100. 180 étudiants de diplôme. Ben, par exemple, euh, entre nous, ici, on a aussi la section de céramique qui a une centaine d'étudiants. Comme ça, peut-être une trentaine qui diplôme. C'est juste pour dire euh, qui aussi a une exposition à la fin de l'année. Mais dans l'école, il y a huit programmes, on dit. Comme ça, le programme sont là, ça. C'est A, Culture and Enterprise, Culture and Enterprise. Euh, je ne dis pas ça avec l'accent français. Culture and Enterprise. Drama and performance, fashion, en fait, ça c'est le, le, le programme le plus connu, euh, c'est vraiment le premier mondial. Euh, bah, en fait, tous sont bons. Mais, <rire> mais bon, la, la plupart du monde euh, connaît CSM pour, pour le mode. Hein, c'est bon, je dis plus de choses en fashion. C'est tout, fini. Graphic communication design, product, ceramic and industrial design, spatial practices. Jewelry and textiles. Je ne fais pas la traduction et je, 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 je crois que vous avez compris tout ça. Mais c'est juste pour dire, aujourd'hui, on a parmi les profs, les profs de A, dans la section à licence et uh, MA, premier cycle, deuxième cycle, et on a aussi deux profs de céramique aussi. Hein. Mais ça, je se maintiens, c'est une école dans l'University of the Arts London. On est, euh, 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 comment on dit ça, on est une université qui spécialise dans les arts. Oh, non. On, on a six collèges dans l'université. Dans comme ça, voilà les, les chiffres. Euh, on a presque quoi, 20 000 étudiants, 1286 euh, profs euh, et techniciens, euh, d'autres 2 000 euh, euh, vacataires, etc. Comme ça, c'est... C'est un, un vrai monstre, c'est énorme. Euh, mais comment ça marche cette notion de recherche En fait, la recherche, euh, euh, je ne touche pas vraiment la recherche dans le sens de l'école, mais en fait, comment les cours, le, la pédagogie, euh, ça marche dans le, 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 la notion de recherche plus large. Comme ça, dans la notion de recherche, on a, bon, c'est simple, on a la pratique artistique et design. Chaque prof a une pratique. Euh, Uh, comme ça, ça c'est très important. Ça, c'est la recherche. Ça, c'est simple. C'est évident. Oui. Et bon, aussi, on a les projets. Et, excusez-moi, juste pour dire, ça, c'est une un image de Martin Westwood qui est ici. C'était une exposition qu'il a fait à Kingston. En fait, il était un, um, un, un chercheur à l'école, mais aussi, il a, il a fini un, un doctorat. Le système troisième cycle, si vous voulez, de doctorat qui est maintenant quelque chose en, en France qui, qui pousse. C'est vraiment dans le système euh, anglais et euh, CSM à l'Université de Arsenal. Et projet, on a, on, on, on a le projet. En fait, on a parmi les profs ici, trois profs, euh, Louise Minkin, euh, Elizabeth Wright et Naomi Dines, qui a participé dans cette euh, euh, chose qui s'appelle Annihilation Event. C'était quelque chose entre euh, une exposition et un événement. Comme ça, c'était... C'est compliqué pour dire, mais je crois peut-être Louise a touché ça dans son présentation plus tard. Mais en fait, c'était une façon de, de, de mettre en place euh, euh, un vêtement qui touche beaucoup de, des aspects de recherche, euh, especialement le, le, le 3D, le scanning 3D, le photogrammetry par exemple. Mais pas que ça. Mais moi, j'ai participé dans un autre projet dans ça. 
Et aussi, il, est, il les écrit, les rédactions du journal, journaux, le Grand France, des choses comme ça. Ça, c'est vraiment dans l'optique. Et par exemple, le, L'image là, c'est une, une édition de la philosophie, le journal de philosophie et photographie. C'était euh, bon, des articles, euh, c'est après un projet, Martin et moi a fait avec le Warburg Institute. Je ne dis pas plus que ça, mais en fait, le sens, on a fait ces projets avec beaucoup des institutions euh, européennes. Euh, le, le sens qu'on publie ça, bon, ça c'est très important dans le sens de diffusion et aussi d'impact. Et ça, c'est une image de Naomi Dines. C'est un, 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 comment dit ça, un scan, un dispositif, dispositif de scan. En fait, c'est dans cette optique de transfert de connaissances. En fait, euh, euh, en anglais, on dit knowledge transfer peut-être, mais, mais ce n'est pas exactement ça. Mais, mais euh, c'est important dans le sens que c'est générer une connaissance autour des de pratiques, des systèmes, des processus, etc. Mais aussi, il y a des enseignements. Quand je dis enseignement, je ne peux pas dire ça. Un enseignement. Mais ça, c'est. Le mot, j'ai mal avec quelques mots. Mais par exemple, j'ai fait un projet qui s'appelle Tableau. Et ça, c'est Jean-François euh, Chevrier, il est de Enspa. Il a fait le séminaire avec nous, euh, qui sont sur ligne maintenant. Mais en fait, tout ça a touché la pédagogie dans un sens absolument précis. Tout ça, c'est normal. Je crois que c'est. C'est dans le, le, le système que vous, vous avez ici. Mais comme ça, il y, un, il, 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 bon, il y a un cercle, un loop, si vous voulez, comme la pratique artistique design, des projets, des créer conférences, euh, transport des connaissances, l'enseignement. Et comme ça, il y a un sens, en fait, l'enseignement passe vers la pratique artistique. C'est comme, 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 comme ça. C'est important, en fait. Il, il y a un euh, mouvement comme ça. Mais dans le sens de recherche, de recherche aussi, euh, il y a les, les autres... Euh, Aspect très important, ça c'est euh, une image fin de l'année, euh, l'exposition le, le, de diplôme des étudiants premier cycle, bah, je sais pas Noël, mais c'est le, le, le beau, c'est la subvention. Mais par exemple, on fait le projet entre nous, entre les institutions, mais la chose qui est importante, c'est chercher l'argent pour soutenir, pour faire les choses très importantes, euh, puis dans, avec l'ambition si vous voulez. Mais comme ça, on cherche l'argent avec le, le, le conseiller euh, d'Angleterre. Comme ça, c'est le Research Council de l'United Kingdom. Aussi, on cherche l'argent à le niveau européen. Par exemple, ça, c'est Creative Europe. Euh, bon, avec les bourses, peut-être plusieurs millions d'euros. De, et aussi, on est évalué dans ce système qui s'appelle le REF. Ça, euh, je ne dis pas grand-chose, exactement pour dire quand on fait la recherche, c'est évalué euh, dans le système euh, de l'éducation supérieure. Mais aussi, l'autre chose qui est importante, c'est le réseau. Et en fait, c'est une image. On a fait un um, séminaire à la Warburg House à Hamburg, qui était euh, tout, tout les, les papiers, tous les, tous les articles sont publiés dans l'image que je, je, je montrais plus, plus tôt. Mais comme ça, le réseau, c'est très important. Ça, c'est le réseau, on est, on est ici. Cette notion, en fait, pour trouver les acteurs dans un réseau qui pour construire, on, la possibilité de construire un projet, c'est très important. Et par exemple, avec, avec moi, j'ai, bon, ça c'est, euh, je travaille avec le réseau de le Warburg House, uh, Bill Fazio, c'est un groupe de recherche allemande, etc. Et la dernière chose, c'est impact. C'est très important, c'est un mot en, en, en entendre tout le temps dans euh, le système anglo-saxon, je crois ici aussi. Mais c'est-à-dire, on fait la recherche, mais on, on a besoin de trouver une audience. Mais, mais c'est juste avec mon recherche personnelle. Par exemple, la plupart des euh, outcomes, les choses euh, qui arrivent, c'est avec le, la publication, la rédaction, aussi les articles, mais avec un réseau qui est américain, allemand, français, par exemple. Bon, je crois que c'est tu, Liz, tu es là. Voilà. Bon, excusez-moi, c'est un peu rapide, j'espère que vous avez compris, mais c'est le dernier mot français peut-être que euh, vous avez euh, ce soir. Mais euh, à la fin, à la fin, si on, il y a des questions, on fait la, la traduction. Je reste avec toi. Ok, okay. excusez-moi, je parle en anglais. 
Um, so I'm going to be introducing a little bit more about St. Tree St. Martins, and in a very short time I'm going to cover radical teaching, the copy, digital archiving, and DIY networks, network wirelesses. Um, so when I first started teaching at St. Tree St. Martins, uh, it was a transitionary period when we were moving from Charing Cross Road to King's Cross. And one of the things that I became particularly interested in was our history, uh, our very infamous history in the sculpture department. Um, and the project that, um, that became infamous was a project called The Lock Room that happened in 1969. So my project is, or my presentation is going to be introducing a little bit about how I've been using uh, that particular history um, and I'm also going to be introducing uh, how we've been thinking about space more recently in terms of a project called the Mazzy Project, um, which I'm introducing here. This is an image of the Mazzy, and later on I'll be explaining a little bit more about what the Mazzy is. And finally, I'll be connecting those two aspects to a project that we're delivering in Sao Paulo in Brazil in the beginning of December. So the presentation is applying the chain operatoire to the pedagogy of the copy from the life to the locked room. So this is the locked room, this is the studio, and uh, the locked room project is, was called the A-Course, and pre-1969, uh, in terms of the UK, there wasn't actually a fixed education system, and the government decided for the first time that they wanted to change and deliver a degree course. So to do that, the, the tutors who'd been teaching had to absolutely rethink what education was. And through that process of rethinking, the studio and the approach to teaching completely changed. Up to that point, uh, teaching had really taken the form of the copy. And through our collective research here, uh, we've been um, looking at archival and archaeological approaches to teaching. And through being introduced to archaeology, I became interested in an archaeological application called the chain operatoire. Uh, this is the process of the chain operatoire. And ordinarily, it's applied to artifacts. And in my research, I wanted to apply this system to pedagogical projects. So here, what we can see is how the form of the artifact changes through applying the sequence called the chain operatoire. So these are the first students, the first stu uh, 12 students who undertook the A course. And uh, on the left-hand corner, we can see the artist, Richard Deacon. Um, two of the other students that we can see here went on to become millionaires. Uh, one introduced the barcode into the UK, and the other one introduced the jelly shoe into the UK. And another one of the students here went on to design all of the sets and the album covers for the, for the Who. So really the question is, um, what was it about this teaching methodology that was so successful and radical, and what impact did it have? So as I said previously, uh, up to this point, the tutors who taught on the A course would have been taught through the process of mimesis and the copy. And my research is really asking this question, is it possible to remove mimesis and the copy from, from teaching? So in the chain repertoire, uh, in the, art, uh, the life of the artifact, the first thing that we look at is the material of the artifact. And in terms of the locked room, and the reason why it was called the locked room project was because the tutors actually locked the students into the studio. And uh, over a period of six weeks, they introduced six different materials. Um, and the students had no idea, there was no invitation of how to use the materials, how to treat the materials, or for what duration of time they might use the materials for. Uh, the other purpose of the research is really to find out uh, within this particular project, which at the time, there's no record of it, the students were told not to document, uh, but they secretly did. They were told not to make notes, um, and 
in, in, in terms of the material, there's actually nothing that's written down. So my research was really using uh, illicit photographs and through interviewing st students and staff that taught on the course. So as we can see here in the image, the uh, part of the material uh, was instruction. So the students were told not to talk, um, they uh, were not given any uh, <coughs> tools, um, and for the duration of uh, the day, they were locked in the room. So the rules, in a way, became tools. And what we see over a period of time is as the students exhausted the materials, eventually their attention turned to the studio itself. And what we see in a sequence of images is how the, the room itself becomes material. So there's also this interest of space that I'll be picking up on later on in the Mazzy, which I introduced at the beginning. So without any instruction, the students, as I say, turn their attention to treating the space as material. And this is how the 12 students use their time whilst being locked in, and this is what happened to the space. So technology is the, the second part of the chain of toile, which is this attention to the tool and, and how we craft the tool and what the tool is. So over the three years that the project to, uh, lasted for, uh, gradually the project shifted to encouraging the students to be aware of the tools that they use to produce their work. So this was another project, and this project is called the Essential <coughs> Equipment Project, and the students were invited to make a presentation of their essential equipment. And this is a presentation of one of the students, John Perk, uh, who was a student that went on to introduce the barcode. And this is his presentation of his essential equipment. Um, the third section of the chain of patois is this idea of use, which is really the site of the tool and how the tool is, is, is used. So the projects changed, and uh, the, the, the third project that was introduced was the, uh, the, this, this project called the Sitting Project. And again, without knowledge, the students went into the space, their names were stuck to the chairs, and they were invited to observe other students in the act of production. So one at a time, a student would, would, would work, and the other students would observe. And here we can see them doing that. So the site within the studio became significant, so this idea of use. And here we see Andrew Dali. This was his designated time to use the studio in the area nominated A, and he chooses to read rather to, than to construct. So this idea of instruction um, uh, continued and students were sent letters with the instruction of what to do on any day. In this final presentation of work, this is Tim Jones' final degree show. Here he's making a presentation of what he's been brought attention to, which is tools themselves. So here we see him actually making a painting of tools. Uh, and then he goes on to make a painting using these photographs that he found on a market in Portobello Road. And what's interesting is what he chooses to, to picture in his final presentation, which is, uh, sorry, is, is written here, is Felician Turi, who's a, a chapographic artist. And this was a, a, a musical act where the chapeau graphic artist would take a, a piece of material, this is in this instance, this piece of felt, and he would craft it into a shape and into a form. So what we're seeing in this project is that what Tim is recognizing is what he's being brought attention to, is how to think about a material and a tool as being a performative act. So here we see the chapeau graph graphic artist um, performing with the material itself. And this is his final presentation. 
So what we find from this project when the students graduate is that the copy continues because what the students do is they copy how they've been taught. So they begin to write instruction in letters to each other, instructing each other to, to perform particular acts. And finally, what we see in, in the final part of the chain of patois is uh, the liberation, the discarding of the, of the tool. And of course, what, what, what we see is, is, is the development, if you like, of, of a tool or the development of a teaching project. So obviously, those students went on to teach, and what they brought with them in terms of the form of the copy was instruction and um, so in, in instruction to copy and instruction to copy the instructions. So we've been working with this archive and um, through working with the archive we've been able to um, work with the staff and the students who uh, delivered the project. So pictured here are, are two of the staff and one of the students. So we're interested in this act of activation of reclaiming history <coughs> and this has taken different forms. So through the act that we just saw we produced a number of notations, recording of the um, activation of the archive and we've using that material um, in, in different ways. So we've actually taken that material and we've put it into an immersive experience in, in VR. And we've also been looking at other radical archives. So we've been working with um, Casa de Povo which is called the House of the People, and Casa de Povo is a building in Sao Paulo. We're interested in working with Brazil because the education system is very similar to our own. Um, and we've been working with their archive. So Casa de Povo has a theater. It has an archive of its uh, teaching pedagogic projects, and it also has an archive of its um, theater history. So one of my colleagues went to work with the theater, one of the things that we've been working with is photogrammetry, and Naomi will be talking about what photogrammetry is. So it's a not for cross way of constructing 3D models. And we were interested in recording the, 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 this uh, derelict theater in Brazil. So through this act, um, we made contact with other radical teaching projects in Brazil, in particular um, one of the, this, um, image which is pictured, pictured here is an occupied house in the center of Brazil and we've been working with a number of the education, um, different education projects in Brazil. One is in the occupied house and the other is in the favelas. So one of the things that's very important about their histories is that their histories isn't recorded and we've been working with them using photogrammetry as a tool to record history from below and to develop new tools to record their, um, their histories. So what's pictured here is the teaching aids of um, somebody called uh, Marcus Silva, who's one of the education uh, workers, and he wanted to use photogrammetry to picture all of his um, teaching material, which he carries around with him to the different favelas. So through this project, we've been working with the Mazi. And uh, the Mazi is a project which is, uh, has a number of partners, one in Brazil and one in um, Greece and the other is in Berlin and the third is at Creekside in London. And this is Creekside and the reason for using the Mazi and the Mazi is a DIY network communication is to connect communities. So this particular community here in Deptford Creek is a boating community and they're under the threat of using their moorings. And so the idea of the Mazi, it's uh, an offline form of communication what, that they can use. Um, this is the Mazi here, and it's uh, a small um, Raspberry Pi, which has a webcam in it, and communication is put together through um, using um, open source methods that, that are pictured here. So as I say, th th these are the tools that go into the... Um, Mazi. Um, we've been introducing the Mazi into the studio. One of the reasons why it's important for Brazil is because it can work off of solar power. And 
Here's James Stevens and Mark Gavitt, who've been working with our students so that we can build our own NASI in the studio. So we've been working with photogrammetry and what we recognize that in the MAZI, because it has a webcam, that we can add an application to the MAZI, which is photogrammetry. So this is a project that we'll be taking to Brazil, which is teaching local people how to use photogrammetry. I'm going to talk a little bit, I think, um, on how photogrammetry came to CSM and kind of how it came to the world. So I was thinking today that we have a phrase in English, um, bringing coals to Newcastle. Um, and I think it probably means the same as maybe bringing porcelain to Limoges. But I'm going to talk about uh, two methods that we're using, which are both actually French by origin. Do you know the uh, work of Francois Guillaume, the 19th century French photographer? Anybody? No? So he's, um, he invented this very uh, interesting process where he made these beautiful sculptures uh, from photographs. So it's a kind of, it was like a kind of magic process. I was, went to a lecture by Alex Galloway, who's a professor at CUNY in New York. He's a Francophile uh, philosopher, but also a member of the Radical Software Group. And he'd done a little bit of research around Guillaume and this, this process, which he uses as a, a way to prefigure an idea of parallel processing. So it's not about the sort of serial history of photography that we think about with Marais or Mybridge or those kind of inventions. It's a something that works on, syn on the synchronic. So for us, the idea of of trying to understand how that process worked, how is it to be done, that question was really, really key. And the kind of sense of how that might produce a methodology for pedagogy um, and how we might answer that question together as academics, as technical staff, as students, uh, without the kind of conventional hierarchies that we find in education, um, that was kind of exciting. So this is how he did it, and it's kind of also how we did it. So you can kind of see that our copy, our reproduction of the process, which we learned to make by trying, um, was not exact. It's, not a, it's a kind of vagabond archaeology in that sense. But basically, this, this beautiful dome was on the Rue d'Etoile in Paris. It had about uh, 50 cameras around the perimeter of the dome. Um, and the, the sitter stood on a central platform with a plumb line over the head. Uh, the uh, cameras were triggered synchron synchronically by uh, an operator, but the, it was a kind of magic because the, um, the sitter didn't know how it was being done. The cameras were hidden behind little statues. So they would then come back three days later and find this kind of very detailed photorealistic statue. And our question was how, how it was done. So it was done uh, the cameras were, were fired synch synchronically and they were then produce a set of silhouettes which were projected onto a screen and the craftsman would use a pantograph to carve each silhouette into a rotating block. So he'd rotate the block 15 degrees. We tried to reproduce it but we produced quite monstrous kind of reproductions. Um, but the process itself of trying to work out the technology, of trying to work out how it was done became a methodology for uh, testing out some other ideas, I guess. Um, so when we started to think about how to work with the photogrammetric process, which was one that we'd come to through archaeology, the first thing we did really was to ruin our own building, to produce a ruin of the institution um, full of holes. The process itself of photogrammetry has an interesting kind of set of origins since Guillaume's kind of uh, thing. I mean, it was very famous in the 1860s when he patented the device. For 10 years, he had a studio in Paris, in New York, in London. Um, but it kind of fell out of, it's a kind of redundant kind of ancestor of, of uh, computational photography, really. 
Um, and the way that it's come into our knowledge is really through working with archaeologists to use it to document excavations um, and use it in a forensic way that Naomi has probably developed more than the archaeologists now. But um, that's the kind of way that we came into it, really, with the kind of sense that it, it is something that is used to document a site. It could be a car crash. It could be uh, an excavation. But something which also has produces a very different kind of sense of what an image might be and an assemblage of images. Um, yeah, so there are kind of all sorts of philosophical and ontological questions that come up and make us think very differently about the notion of what an image actually is or might be. So this is just to say a little about the anatomy of a digital model, which I would imagine in your context here you know a fair bit about, but the kind of sense of, of this very different anatomy to a kind of uh, material model, so how a point cloud is built, how this becomes a mesh, how we apply a material. This is a photogrammetric texture or image or uh, the file which sits as image across the armature. And then you see the kind of final model. But we worked this all out with the students. So these were kind of um, projects that Liz and I worked on and Naomi um, over about th three or four years now um, and every year working with as a kind of lab with a group of students to work these ideas through really with the sense that the students might then appropriate process and work it through in their own practices but that by asking a question we kind of together we would kind of learn something which could then be applied so the other project i'm going to talk about um, has some relation to it in the sense that it's it's a project i think one of the things that was very interesting about the digital model was its likeness, its kind of its uh, its sense of um, the, the questioning that you might have about the, the materialities that it could be expressed with. So then we came back to another project working with the Bilderfahrzeuger at the Warburg through Mick um, and with the British Museum and with our kind of nascent group at CSM, the students and staff, to look at another French process, which was the process of paper casting. So uh, this manual, which we got a copy of, um, of Lotino Plastique, which was the kind of brand name for the paper casting. And it was, again, a very popular process, slightly earlier uh, in time than Francois Villain, but it was a way of transporting antiquities very lightly, like a digital model with no sense of gravity, right across the world. So obviously, in, that, in the kind of Britain of the antiquaries, this became a method of cultural extraction in order to kind of commodify uh, other cultures. Um, the British Museum has a collection of casts that were made using this process by Alfred Maudsley, a very famous British antiquarian. They're in the secondary collection largely nowadays, so they're in storage. Um, and it's a collection from Guatemala. This is a little section from the manual where uh, he talks about his travels. But one of the very interesting things is the kind of the sense that the process was made in situ, so he recommends to use local papers. But it, there are lots of failures within it which actually then become kind of successes. So he lost a lot of the casts because he didn't know how to waterproof them and they had to be brought back on a ship, you know, from long distances. The casts had to be very light to be brought down a mountain. And he managed to bring back whole architectural complexes. This, these ones from Guatemala, um, very interesting. So the British Museum has a, a very rare collection of the paper squeezes, they're called, the squeezed paper. Um, and they're quite interesting objects because legally, until very recently, they d didn't exist because they weren't accessioned into the museum collection. So although they are physically there, we couldn't borrow them or do anything with them um, because they were discarded as a kind of mold, as a kind of, um, like the molds that we've seen at the Casso this week. Um, they were things which people didn't particularly value um, because they weren't the original. Actually, what's fascinating about them is that they now hold more detail than the buildings which are eroded because of acid rain, so that in fact the casts have suddenly become very valuable um, in terms of their retention of information which is otherwise lost. So these are just some pictures of the storage of the, of the um, casts at the British Museum. So we, again, use this as a teaching project to reconstruct reconstruct both the paper casting process but also to apply some of the archaeological techniques that we've been using so uh, photogrammetry to reconstruct 3D models but also the reflectance transformation imaging um, which 
gives you very interesting details of surface that are not normally visible to the human eye. Um, we also kind of did some digital inversion of the molds, which was fun because we learned how to do it that way, but it also answered some academic questions for the academic researchers too. So that was in itself quite an interesting process that as artists sort of stumbling through something, we were answering some um, very valid kind of uh, questions from the academics involved. Uh, the British Museum are also working with Google on, on this project. So basically what's happening with the 3D scans from Guatemala is that they're being dropped back into Google Maps so that when you visit the site on Google Maps, you'll actually be visiting the scans rather than the, 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 the degraded objects which are now in situ. Um, yeah. So we kind of took this project on and the students uh, worked into it in their own ways and I'm just going to show you a little bit about what they did. It was something that we brought as a kind of prototype event to Tate Modern uh, last January for a day uh, where the students kind of had learned workshopping skills and they were engaging the public in the process and teaching people. So that was very much part of what we're doing is a sense of not just the transport of images but also the transport of ideas and skills. Uh, yeah. And these are what some of the students have taken on in their work. So Nicola, who was an Italian student, was looked at the Campari fountains, which were fountains in Italy, which were funded apparently by the Campari factory, and they would occasionally spurt Campari rather than water, I think. There's only two of them left now, one of them in New York. But he made paper casts of those things in order to bring them back. And also um, there are animated films, which I, I won't show you in this context. We also cast, uh, this is... Uh, from a mold that was made from the old Letherby Gallery, so another piece of Central St. Martin's history in the old Central School on Southampton Row, which is now a hotel, I think. Um, but this mold was sitting in our cast room, so we used, we made a positive from the mold and took a paper cast from that to kind of, uh, so looking at the paper mold, I guess, as, a, as the, the object of interest rather than the, the, the cast, yeah. And these were some stuff that one of the students again did around the transport of images. So these are bits of a van. Um, he was thinking about the, Brit the, the model of the British Museum van, which again is kind of transporting stuff around London incognito. But these are kind of paper molds of the interior, which became actually very bodily and kind of quite interesting relation, like a tongue and a palette. Um, so yeah, those are just a couple of pedagogical applications of some of the research we've been doing. Excuse me, I might use my notes because I've translated my presentation so I've got no idea what it says now. <laughs> um, my name's Emma Lacey. I teach on the ceramic design program at Central St. Martins. Um, it's also my company name. I have a small ceramic design business um, and I design and make tableware which I sell into the high-end retail market and into dining context restaurants. So... Um, I'm asking the question in my practice, how can I encourage lasting engagement with everyday ceramic objects? So how can I encourage people to keep the pieces that I make and not become part of this throwaway culture of ceramic production? Um, so I'm going to touch on some of the work that I made 10 years ago as part of my MA research, which was a playful way of looking at how we make uh, ceramic tableware engaging. So this was um, the click cup that I designed. So when it's empty, the weight of the handle means that it rests in a sort of angled recess in the well of the saucer. And when you fill it up with tea, it just rocks into place and then functions as a normal cup and saucer. So it's about this kind of engagement with the object, the object having design details that make you notice the object that you're using and form some kind of, kind of relationship with it. Um, and this cup I called slide, so it's got a rounded bottom and it just sort of moves in the saucer. It's almost like when you're doodling on a, pe on a piece of paper with a pen, it's got sort of physical doodle with it. So you build another tactile relationship with the object beyond just using it to drink from. Oh. 
I didn't show you the image, sorry. This was the click cup that I was describing. Uh, and the slide that moves in the saucer. And then these were the duo cups. So I subverted the shape slightly so the rim becomes oval. And that means that when you place the handle on the cup, it means you have to navigate the way you drink from it. It changes the ergonomic of the cup. And the idea was that there were two different handle positions and you would choose your favorite one, therefore, again, building a relationship with the ceramic object um, beyond just using it to drink from. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> um, so um, is it about dual functions? So it's, again, about offering a choice within the designed object. So this is a salt pig. So you can either take the salt out of the piece using a little spoon, or if you put the cork in the hole, you can use it as a salt and pepper shaker. So it's allowing choice in the object, and again, sort of a personal choice um, in the way you use it. This is my everyday mug. These are hand thrown. Um, this is the piece that I sell the most of. So is it through ergonomics? Um, the dent in the piece means it's comfortable to hold. And again, looking at where the handle position is in relation to that dent means that there's a sort of um, comfortable ergonomic when you drink from it. Um, but it also talks about the materiality of the object. So that dent in the piece talks about the plasticity of the clay when it's wet. Um, so the object talks about the process and the material from which it's made. Um, tactility is really important to me. So even in the, in the back stamp, so my signature on the bottom of the mug, when you look at it from the side, you can just see there's a tiny little notch taken out of the shape. So sometimes it looks like there's a little chip or something. But you can feel that when you drink from the piece. Um, and again, uh, it encourages you to look at the details of the piece and get to know the object over time. Some of the details you might not notice immediately when you see it on a shop shelf. But there's these small details that encourage a, a lasting relationship as you get to know the object, hopefully. Uh, so is it by chance? Um, by overlapping two glazes here, the satin glaze at the top and a glossy glaze at the bottom, um, I offer a tactile experience, but also where the two glazes meet, where they collide, um, there's a reaction, and that reaction is always different depending on the thickness of the glaze, uh, slight changes of position in the kiln, which can change the temperature, so every one of these pieces is, is unique. Um, is it through colour? Um, I primarily used to call myself a shape designer, but by extending range using colour, again, you offer this option of personal choice, so people have an emotional connection to a particular colour. They choose a colour um, uh, according to taste or preference, so it becomes personal again. And by having a broad colour range, you also... Um, offer choice so people can pick and curate their own color palettes, um, building personal collections or bespoke collections. Um, is it by making something by hand? Is it the touch or the gesture of the hand that encourages a relationship with the object? Um, again, talks about the materiality of clay. Um, I've just put an example in there of Hella Jungarius's um, range for Tickler Macum, which I particularly like because of the way the surface, the hand-painted surface decoration travels from a glazed area on the clay to the unglazed area. So again, it talks about the materiality. There's a real tactility to this piece. Or can it be by machine? So as I say, most of the work I make is, is made by hand. But I'm interested in the idea of um, whether you can imitate some of those gestures using CAD technology or using machines and, and what, what this does to the object. Um, I put the um, TAC1 cup 
the bottom there, it's designed by Walter Gropius, a sort of a Bauhaus piece for Rosenthal, because it's one of my favourite industrially produced pieces. I feel like it doesn't always have to have the mark of the hand to have that attention to detail, which draws us into an object. So um, when I first picked up that object, I noticed how light it was. It was really fine which led me to turn the object over to look at where, who'd made it. And then I saw that the bottom was glazed all over, so they hadn't left a foot ring to stand on the kiln, which led me to look at the rim of the cup. So if it hasn't fired this way up, how did they fire it? And the rim's polished but unglazed. And so this very slow journey through the object kind of was a bit of a light bulb moment for me. It was that how this object started to tell me about the manufacturing process that it had been through um, as a result of these design dim details. So I suppose what I'm interested in then is can the intervention of digital technology produce a gesture with a similar value to that of the handmade? Um, and asking what happens if the object, uh, to the object if we imitate or trace the, hand of the, of, uh, the, trace the gestures of the hand, what, what does this do to the object? Uh, can it create new narratives or stories um, and reasons to engage with and value the object? I imagine it's all in the detail. I haven't answered the question yet. Thank you. Tony Quinn, the uh, chef de PA ceramics. Um, okay, hello. Uh, sorry, bonjour, not bonsoir. Um, my name is Tony Quinn. I'm the course leader for PA ceramic design. I'm a designer also, and for the last five years I've worked with computer scientists. And recently it made me consider how to describe my practice. So prior to two weeks ago, I would have said I was a designer. Now I describe myself as a human interaction or interaction designer. And that's because I've reverse engineered my whole entire practice to cover the idea of interaction design. Um, so this is where I began, the you know, classic tableware for people like Wedgwood. Um, Lots of years of practice, 15, 20 years of practice working in the sort of paradigm of the table, very much like Benadol or the fine porcelain companies that are based here. Then I work with British Airways, so I move into sort of designing for experience. So this is about how the object facilitates an experience in an quite complex service arena. Um, so I had to do things like, you know, consider every element of the sort of experience of flying. I'm also an idealist. I'm part of a group based in Scandinavia where we do lots of uh, engaging projects. So I work in a prison and I do co-design experience with inmates and students and we take them to a beautiful prison, well, a, a, a beautiful place for the prison, and we work in an interesting way. And then five years ago, I started working in this um, project called R Codes. And R Codes is about bringing a sort of human element into interaction design. So this here is a code. In a minute, I'm going to get you all to draw one. I'm going to teach you. Um, so. The interesting part about this is a barcode, which was introduced, I found out today, um, by a French guy. This is a QR code, and this is an R code. And it's our position as researchers that interaction should be beautiful and should be engaging and poetic and playful and not look like the computer designed it. The barcode's pretty much unbeatable, but the QR code, less so. This is an R code. This is what the future could look like. And there's no reason why. We have a completely open source technology. So today I'm going to give it to you and you can do what you wish. Um, so I commissioned an illustrator to make a code look almost as far away from looking like a code as possible. I collaborate with these guys. 
uh, called the Mixed Reality Lab, which is a group of computer scientists based in the University of Nottingham. And they just do crazy stuff. Here we're exploring the idea of thrill. So this is a, um, just forgotten his name, but he is basically wiring people up on a roller coaster to collect data to work out what to do with the data. Uh, this is our first edition of our codes. We designed a dining service structure for a Thai restaurant. Um, and so when you scan the plate, you got uh, the recipe of the dish. When you scanned this table mat, you got a GoPro picture, uh, film of the kitchen of the chef cooking your food. This is the Carolan guitar. This tours the country on its own and we track it by scanning. So there's musicians handing this guitar from one musician to the next and they play it. And all of these different codes uh, re result in a different interaction. Um, we've also worked with fabric. So we're trying moving into wearables. So there's no reason why you know, your clothing, which has pattern and motif, could not be interactive. Um, it's a very simple process, it's a simple set of drawing rules, and we're working with uh, computer-engineered embroidery and mapping. We also looked at a concept for bill payment in a restaurant. So the industry standard for asking for your bill and leaving the restaurant is 14 minutes. So this was the idea to speed up the process, so you use your PayPal and you scan your table and you leave. There is a security problem with this because we trial this and people just left and didn't pay. So. Um, this is also interactive wallpaper for the National Trust. Um, and so here the illustrator has designed wallpaper to uh, develop a sort of interactive experience that is connected to the site it's installed in. So the, the viewer here for the iPad. So, these are all the same code, but look different. So this is where it moves away from what the QR code does, because QR code just looks like the QR code. Here, three different designers, three different images, all the same interaction. Whereas, this is the same image with different code. So here you can see how we can make beautiful interaction through graphic motif. Um, it's just to do with this here is different in each one. I'll explain it in one second. Okay, so, time for five minutes. So it is our position that the R code is the first truly intuitive interaction tool for designers and artists. So here is it with the app here. So, okay, I'm going to teach you how to do it. You should have a pen and a piece of paper and I'm gonna draw and I just want you to copy what I draw. It's really simple, it's a set of three actions. Ready? So we're going to draw this. So we have a body. Okay, so it's one continuous, I, I checked the word, so it's a, a boundary, a frontier. Okay. Uh, Ferme, closed, okay, no gaps, no gaps. And then we have one, two, three, four, five regions. I should do it French, 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 
Okay, this is the important bit. You have to do the exact same uh, mark as me. One. One. Okay, so this is now a complete R code. It says a frontier, uh, the region, and the mark, and the code is one. One, two, four, four. And this will point to a URL. Afterwards, you can come and you can use my app to scan your drawing and we can check whether you've succeeded or not. Uh, our code, our code, and and you can download the app in Google Play, an app store, and it's completely open. You can configure it, and you can play with it yourself. Art code. Bonsoir. Um, so I'm Joey Brunelska, and um, I teach on uh, the BA course at Central St. Martins um, uh, in fine art um, on the 2D pathway. Okay, so whilst that's being sorted out, I will just um, do a quick introduction so we don't lose too much time. Um, I'm going today to talk to you about um, how, as an artist, I've approached working with another discipline. Yeah? Thank you. Is it doing it? I don't mind as the interface. Okay. And then does that come down to the screen? Okay. Um, and uh, specifically, um, to do with how artistic research comes into contact with another discipline, and in this case, that of archaeology. Um, and uh, it's this idea that a project that I've been, been engaged uh, in with uh, Martin Westwood, who's, who's going to present after me, um, uh, over the past four years. Um, we've kind of been really interested in um, examining the methods of another discipline, um, particularly when we cross from the arts to the sciences and vice versa and how that throws up a whole kind of uh, set of interesting problematics and questions um, for thinking about how transdisciplinary collaboration should operate and what it is for. Um, so I'm going to first briefly introduce some ideas uh, to do with archaeology. Um, uh, why it might be interesting for artists or people who are involved in design. Um, and, uh, and then I'm going to um, uh, show you some images quickly of um, some recent work that Martin and I um, have done in Maastricht, um, um, which has kind of taken the form of uh, 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 different forms of site-based research, exhibition, um, writing. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, so Martin and I have a shared fascination in the ability of technology, um, uh, um, the way that technology administration and bureaucracy um, uh, can potentially manipulate and reshape our understanding of time, history, uh, and the leftovers of material culture. Um, so the temporal relationships that exist between mediation technology and reuse. 
specifically how these relationships change popular cultural perceptions of heritage and their narratives of value. So heritage is something that packages history and artifact and material culture and through that forms these narratives of value. Okay. So why, uh, first of all, the question is why might archaeology be interesting for artists? Um, and it's really a question of what gets left over, um, what gets, uh, you know, what is kind of left over after everything else is gone. So archaeology uh, digs, um, probes, analyzes material culture, often destroying it in the process. It's a very destructive process. Um, and artists historically have tended to um, make and appropriate similar kinds of cultural remains um, uh, and destroy them, often also synthesizing them into something new. So a kind of a, a corpse from which to pick um, and perhaps reanimate. Archaeologists and artists also construct narratives around objects. Um, uh, you know, stories that can be revised or completely rewritten. So this is, this is um, uh, something about heritage and how it constructs a story around an object um, or the negative remains, so what isn't there. Um, stories that can be revised or completely rewritten um, when new knowledge comes to light um, or a new agenda, um, uh, political agenda, for example. Um, heritage is therefore the thing that mediates archaeology. It tells a story about what it is and why it is important. The story is the thing that adds value. Um, and at the extreme uh, end of this um, symbiotic potential, I go back here, at the extreme end of this symbiotic potential, um, heritage actually um, uh, has a very kind of um, parasitical relationship with its subject, um, and it can appear to be so interlaced. Um, this is that you saw the image um, earlier on here. These are um, information, degraded information panels um, at an Etruscan site uh, called Lago uh, della Cessa. Um, where the, uh, the panel has degraded over a period of uh, perhaps nine years, um, and it forms its own kind of overlaying ruin on top of the thing that it's actually representing. Um. Um, art and archaeology have their own uh, cliches. So, you know, they both have their own uh, traditions and conventions. Um, and, uh, you know, they are connected through archaeology's relationship to um, uh, its antiquarian history. So the fact that it was, uh, that it's only recently become a science. Um, uh, and, and this is also something in a kind of popular consciousness that when we tend to think of ruins, we think of them in this kind of very romantic sense, um, perhaps. Um, uh, and this romanticized notion is something that's kind of embedded, I think, um, uh, in popular culture. And what, what Martin and I found, and I'm going to talk about in a minute, is that um, uh, we actually had an encounter with the kind of opposite of that. Um, but just before, so art and archaeology are also greedy. So they absorb um, and this is, uh, um, you know, many different kinds of, uh, many different kinds of um, uh, humanities um, and um, scientific disciplines um, absorb and synthesize um, all the different techniques, tools, um, uh, theory, philosophy, practice they can get their hands on. They want it all. Um, and uh, so they're continually expanding their technological toolbox. And so what we came across um, in our recent research, which, which was that uh, instead of um, uh, thinking about archaeology informing us, informing us of a past, um, a story that has, that has happened some time ago, 
The ruin is also telling us what will come in the future. Um, and this is because, um, I, this is particularly kind of um, uh, urgent or prescient when you think about um, the new, uh, new ruins or future projections of the Anthropocene that you can see over here. So what you can actually see is a um, archeological dig um, in a place near Nîmes called Belgarde. And above it is um, a landfill, so an urban uh, landfill waste um, site. Uh, and you had all the archaeologists working below um, wearing respirators, um, entirely clothed in white suits because they were afraid of the kind of contamination from the landfill site that they were working on. Um, so you have this... Uh, a very different sense of what the ruin is in this case, and it tells us much more about the future than a past. Okay, okay so in 2013, um, Martin and I were awarded a NEARC fellowship at the Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht, um, where, the, uh, where we were partnered with three um, institutions, um, archaeological institutions, um, and the aim was uh, to get artists uh, and archaeologists to question each other's ways of working and question each other's methodologies through a series of um, uh, site visits um, uh, and uh, uh, looking at how, particularly in our case, how um, different forms of technology um, and uh, heritage were kind of interwoven together to kind of construct new narratives. Um, and uh, we were partnered with, um, yes, the other, the other partners other than uh, the Jan van Eyck Academy who awarded the fellowship were the um, archaeological unit of Saint-Denis, just outside of Paris, um, and uh, INRAP. Uh, the Institute of Preventive Archaeology, which, uh, as many of you may know, um, is uh, a public um, uh, institution in France, uh, numbering over about 2,000 archaeologists. And it deals specifically with the uh, um, demands um, uh, that uh, development and large-scale large construction, um, what happens when things are dug out of the ground, because um, something needs to be constructed or built. So high-speed high rail links, motorway excavations, that kind of thing. And so um, uh, during the course of our experiences with the archaeologists, we actually discovered that the things that we were more interested in than their kind of um, uh, than th perhaps the site itself um, or the artifact um, was actually uh, the kind of holes, gaps, and waste that were um, uh, that were produced in the course of um, uh, in the course of their research, but also within our encounter with them. Um, so we started to look at how. Um, and this is the exhibition um, that we showed uh, at Mara's House for Culture. So we started to look at how constellations of raw materials, information, objects, everyday routines, and disciplinary boundaries can be considered equally responsible um, and even culpable partners in constructing historical heart artifacts and in doing so their powerful potential to propose alternative narrati narratives, both of the past and the future. Um, and we uh, involved a series of uh, motifs that we'd um, encountered in the, in the process. So the, um, the attic space, the cruel space of a Gothic cathedral, um, a headless saint, Saint-Denis, carrying his head in his hands, um, preaching a sermon uh, along, uh, along the banks of the Seine, um, a high-speed rail link carving a monumental piece of land art into the French countryside. Um, and the search for an archaeological spoil heap on an island off the coast of Gothenburg. So here are some more images. And there was a four-channel video. Um, I, I'm afraid I don't have uh, time uh, to show that uh, clip uh, of that to you today. Um, 
but uh, it also um, uh, involves footage of a um, of hair being cut in an industrial guillotine. So there are all these kinds of motifs of waste, division, um, uh, peripherality. So what happens outside of the thing that you're supposed to be looking at? Um, and there we go. Okay. Um, and this also took uh, kind of um, uh, different forms of um, uh, the diagrammatic, and uh, we were kind of in also interested in empirical method as well um, as a way to kind of produce um, method reflexively from waste. Uh, and there's uh, some screenshots of the video. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to leave you with this quote by, uh, from an archaeologist um, that we met during our research that, who said, data debunks myth, but more data makes it harder to tell any story at all. And so I just want to leave you with that um, thought. Okay, thank you. Excuse-moi, uh, excuse uh, je ne peux pas parler français. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about a, um, a research project that I was doing at Central St. Martin's over a period of three years called Headstone to Hard Drive, um, which was a project which was looking at uh, the agencies of technology and media as, as co-authors of content and considering what the consequences were for critical and artistic practices of uh, liberation of memory. Um, that is performed by technical prostheses. Um, this is, was an approach which was giving an immediate sort of semiotic and physiologic relevance to media. It was really concerned with the sort of differences between um, within iterations of cultural objects and cultural information um, and specifically with the distinctions between information which is traveling via the roots of um, artifact, object, material culture, and the notion of information as being in some way separated from that. So on the one hand, we're talking about the distinctions between artifacts and technologies which are specifically designed to preserve memory. Um, the differences between flint tools, car parks, lampshades, or tattoos, writing, phonography, um, microprocessors. So it was really about concerns as well with the transdisciplinary area. Um, and considering about art practice itself, there's been a form of mediation between different practices, different and different forms of thought. So this is kind of like trying to position um, a value for art practices as somehow being able to perceive a kind of hidden secret within other, um, other disciplinary areas. Um, and specifically was engaging with sets of practices um, from media theory to philosophies of technology, philosophies of the market, uh, looking at this through financial tools, um, specifically derivatives trading, um, archaeology, the history of art, um, and probably in the most more general way, um, cultural technologies, cultural techniques, a sort of techno-anthropological um, area. There was um, I kind of wanted to sort of boil this down to maybe three sort of objectives and a question. Um, a, a question being, well, what would, what does the, the, the areas that I've been just suggesting to you, what kind of consequences does this have for, not just, not, sp not exactly art practices, but for the role of, uh, or the persistent role of aesthetics within art practices and raising a question towards that. 
Um, this was looked at or um, thought about through one hand the notion of the biography of the object. So how information is traveling across time, how cross-generational memory is being passed on, but also trying to look at the value of artifacts as things which are moving through um, a political and economic and production space of production. In, th in that way, trying to offset the uh, question of the subjective response, which is inherent to um, most aesthetic theory. Um, this was also trying to overlay on this question or think this question through uh, via, um, via monetary tools, of thinking about how value is produced. So this was trying to pr like look at both different forms of information and think about how different forms of value become present in uh, these different objects and information. So to try and be a bit more specific about how I might, be, might have been thinking about these things, um, I got particularly uh, taken by um, a stock digital photograph that I came across, um, which was taken by a photographer called Vittorio Cialotto. Um, and this was available as a stock digital file to download from Getty Images website. It also happened to be um, a photograph of an artwork by an American artist of the 1980s called Katie Noland, which in its own turn was an appropriation of a photograph by Robert Jackson of the shooting of Lee Harvey Oswald in 1963. I was concerned with thinking through what this object could be um, and what kind of object I was looking at once it, as an image, had appeared under the guise of several, three different technical supports. Um, so it's three different technical supports which also have a, an inflection of cultural genre about them. So that we're looking at both the movement from photojournalism to artwork to a stock digital file. And each one of these moments of a technical apparatus giving uh, an, a, the appearance for this image to occur. Uh, containing their own sets of value systems and therefore inflections upon what this image might be, might mean, how it could be considered. So that, to, to try and overlay that with a little more with the second question that I was trying to bring up about um, value and speculation, that I was concerned to think about different statuses of what these genres might be, photojournalism, artwork, stop digital file, and how they might be rearranging and representing value to us. Um, and that was done through thinking about monetary instruments, thinking about monetary instruments of uh, metallic money, or thinking about, so I should just slightly explain that the, the image on the left is uh, Thomas Nast um, etching from the 1870s, um, and published in America at a point when they were um, establishing a lot of paper money. So we have um, a hanging coin, the metallic money, and a shadow in the background which has greenbacks written across it. Greenbacks being a, a colloquial slang word for dollar, for paper money, for green money, for notes. Um, and it's produced at a time where there, when the, the market has been flooded with paper money due to um, uh, printing finances to keep the American Civil War going and it's given, um, it's given occasion for large-scale inflation. So it's produced at a time when there's a great skepticism and suspicion of the value system of paper money as opposed to metallic money. Um, on the right-hand side, we're looking at a, uh, a time price series, time price series of speculating the possible, possible future values of derivatives. Um, so from looking at previous price series as backwards with derivatives, you then come up to, you speculate the potential value of these in the future and um, you sell various insurance policies upon what that future value of any given commodity might be. Now I was interested that how, we how I might be able to, to overlay those as types of value systems upon um, 
something which has a kind of purchase on the real, such as photojournalism, as a, a sort of form of or, or, or presentation of a type of engagement as a view that you might have with this, um, which was equivalent to a kind of metallic money, a kind of cashing in of the real. Um, uh, the artwork being sitting in another kind of economy, another kind of economization, and of an equivalence to something like um, the paper, paper check. But more, most importantly was the thinking about what certain new types of objects were, which were sitting there on a, simply on a kind of higher purchase level, which were set out with various different kinds of uses for which you would pay different um, amounts and that the stock digital image had some relationship to uh, the financial derivative. Um, so thinking a little further about what those kinds of questions might be, we, um, uh, the top image is, a, the, uh, is a, the, called the Bulba percussion. Um, it's a, a flint tool. So this is the earliest um, surviving witness to uh, tool production that we have, beginning of changes to the, uh, the, the lith lithosphere through tool use. The bottom image is a 3D print made by, um, uh, sponsored by Foster's Architects, and it's a building block for lunar hab habitation. It's, um, the idea was that they would vacuum up the surface of the moon, um, which is made of, of dust called regolith, and through mirrors, the heat, they would point mirrors at the sun, and through the heat of these mirrors, they would then melt the regolith in order to 3D print um, building blocks. And you end up with something in this case, which is um, a very uh, uh, distended um, object which looks more like um, a, a prehistoric or Etruscan ruin um, than it does sits easily within the uh, futuristic narrative which is it is actually part of. Um, so th the, th the main way in which the, the project has done to hard drive proceeded was as a discursive practice um, which took the form of three um, mainly took the form of three symposium events which were held at Central St. Martin's and the British School at Rome. This is at the bottom there we have um, a, a quote from Felicity Coleman who was one of the participants in, in the uh, second Headstones to Hard Drive project um, where she's drawing attention to, to the replacement of, 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 of an aesthetic space with a data politics of time. I have to keep, because I can't understand what my slides are saying now because they're French. Um, um, okay, so we're um, just looking at the, some of the ways in which we're looking at um, objects through the third event of Headstones to Hard Drive about borrowed things, um, observed things, and uh, temporal things and thingly things, and the, the event of that particular event was specifically bringing together um, artists, archaeologists, and art historians to look at different um, methodological approaches towards how time was being produced in each of those disciplines. Um, much of the project had been inspired by uh, reading Bernard Stiegler's te Techniques and Time, um, and considering the uh, relationships between uh, the history of phenomenology, phenomen phenomenology and how it had uh, largely denied a role for technical memory or memory which was inorganic outside of uh, the, the human's biological memory. So th the position that it really is, is a question that allowed me to, to get to was um, to not be asking the question about uh, what is an, an artist expressing, uh, but to be asking a question about where you find um, expression in an assemblage, or maybe the question is also to not ask what time is it, but uh, où est le temps? Thank you.
about a project that I've... Microphone, sorry. Yeah. I'm going to talk about a project that I've been working on for one year. Um, so I'm going to go very fast in five minutes through one year of research and development. Um, the diagram here, I'm sorry it's in English, but um, a little kind of circular journey around my practice. The digital, material, art practice, anthropology, um, uh, patrimony, uh, forensis, uh, uh, engineering, <laughs> uh, design, uh, technology, and craft. Uh, and the research and development has been necessary to further uh, my artistic intentions. So um, I've tried to translate everything into French so that I can go quite fast and you can read on the screen. So um, I'm working in forensic capture, uh, uh, making digital found objects uh, for the moment. Uh, so these are um, artifacts from my family, um, my uh, father's um, naval cat badge and the cat badge of my brother who came after him into the Navy. Um, so these objects are very particular. They have a lot of history and trace on them um, and they're very, very difficult to capture um, using uh, 3D scanning uh, and photogrammetry which we've heard a little bit about earlier from uh, Elizabeth and Louisa. Um, so I have a challenge um, to try to capture these objects for my practice to use to make ultimately sculpture, animation, um, virtual reality. So it's a, it's a challenge. So um, I've solved the problem and I'm gonna show you how I arrived at the solution um, through some photogrammetry techniques. So this is a photographic image and this is the 3D model, uh, which is identical. It's a very, very, very good photogrammetric model. <laughs> so I'm going to show you how that happened. Uh, it was a long journey, but we got there in the end. So, um, yeah, so this is the textured model of my brother's badge in Agisoft Photoscan Pro, and it's, it's totally photorealistic and totally accurate. Um, so I'm doing something that I call very close-range photogrammetry, um, and a little bit about how the technique works, it, it's deriving 3D models from um, with surface textures, so the appearance um, from digital images. Uh, so this image from the software, Agisoft Photoscan Pro, shows you how that works, that the blue um, panels are the positions of the cameras around the object, um, and the software can recombine those images to, to, to reconstruct a three-dimensional form. Uh, so this is the, the um, uh, naval military wings from my father's uniform um, in, in Agisoft. Uh, so the model is of an object that is um, 60 millimeters, so small thing um, and very, very detailed and very, very difficult to capture uh, because um, it's small, it's symmetrical, it's very detailed, it's dark and it has metallic reflections. So everybody said you can't do this. It's impossible with this technique. So I went, oh, okay, I'll try. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so I developed um, apparatus, uh, methods, and devices to try to get around the problems that were inherent uh, with the process. Uh, so I, what I wanted were these incredibly <laughs> high resolution um, digital objects that I could do anything with and that had minimal um, labor required to, to make them good. Uh, so. Uh, the basis of the um, method and the, the equipment I've been using is a single one DSLR camera um, and already available photographic equipment. So this is relatively cheap. Um, it's available to anyone who has access to an art school because this stuff is all in the cupboard already. Um, and through simple methods and a sort of rigor, uh, you're able to get models like that without um, spending too much money or time. Uh, so the red arrow at the bottom is the fundamental principle, which is orthographic alignment. That's the sort of thing that makes all this possible. Um, so, uh, as I said <laughs> in French, uh, yeah, so, so this was my first um, photogrammetry rig, and everything was, was from uh, pre-existing photographic equipment that the college already has. Um, so don't worry too much about that. This is uh, a little description of the scalability. So another problem with photogrammetry is it tends to be um, fixed to the scale of the object. If you have a, a capture rig, it tends to be fixed to small, medium, large, very large objects. 
I wanted a rig that you could capture anything with. So um, this was a trying to work on a medium scale and in a, in a way that was portable. So this is a pop-up capture. We went to the Tate Modern for one day. It was pretty full on, but uh, we set up the rig and we captured objects that I'd never seen before from a museum um, collection. So in the bottom uh, right-hand side is the object. It was symmetrical, it was shiny, it was relatively monochrome. So again, very challenging uh, to capture. But um, with very little <laughs> intervention, we get an incredibly good um, mesh and textured model um, using this technique, this method. It also is applicable to uh, larger things. Uh, so here we were trying to capture a very, very challenging object. Um, this, this object is from the 15th century, so it's worth a lot of money. It's absolutely unique in the museum collection of our college. Um, and it's made of parchment, so it's translucent. So it's like a total challenge um, for photogrammetry. So we made a, a system. Uh, so I, I planned the, the um, locations of all the cameras. I built a special archival support, not to damage the map, but also to be able to shoot it from underneath without moving it because it's flexible. Um, and then we uh, proceeded to try to capture the object. So um, uh, doing focus bracketing is essential with something like this because the light had to be very low. In this image here, it looks quite bright, but in, in the, at the time it was very dark inside. Um, and in order to get the depth of field, we have to bracket the focus. Um, so that's what's happening here, is, is capturing different focal depths. Um, another important element is to be able to use these automatically recognizable targets, which I'll talk about a little later. So they aid the software in reconstructing the object, particularly when you have something very thin. It's a challenge for photogrammetry. So by using the targets around the thin edge, um, we were able to compensate for the lack of uh, thickness and information. The top surface was easy because it's very highly detailed and very colored. So the photogrammetry is fine with that. But the underside was, was monochrome. It was very thin and there was nothing for, them, for the software to get hold of. Um, so on the left, you have the mesh. On the right, there's a detail from the map surface itself. So interestingly, uh, for the first time, the museum was able to understand how the map had been drawn because suddenly they could see all the puncture holes and the inscribed lines where they'd constructed the, the geometry of the rum lines, um, so the directions, the compass directions on the map. So it was a, it was a revealing um, model for them to have at this, at this detail. Um, so uh, the, the method that I've been using uh, uses a, a rotating object and a static camera, which is the wrong way around for the, for the algorithms of photogrammetry. The, the software is designed for a moving camera. So if you want to use a rotating object, a turntable, you have to trick it um, into thinking the camera is moving. Um, so again, the important things of orthographic alignment, um, a, a controlled angular, angular rotation, and then a varied camera angle um, so that you can get different rings of images around your object. So it, it becomes much more precise, much faster, much more efficient um, in terms of actually staging the capture um, but it is a more difficult um, technical thing. So um, the principles are very simple. Uh, the orthographic axis, the Z axis in the image there, and then choosing different um, camera um, angles in relation to the object. So the object would sit on that um, thing on the right, which I'll tell you about in a moment, and then the camera changes its position very easily. By using these geared tripods, which are just from the photography department, you can very, very quickly change the angle of the camera without setting up the whole shoot again, and that saves a lot of time. So uh, top angle is flip the head, take the gears up and down on the two tripods, and you've got it. Very simple. Okay, so like I said, the uh, angular rotation of the object is something that then the software thinks is movement of cameras, which is what you want. Um, so I used a photographic motion controller, uh, which was a linear device, but I uh, reprogrammed it to think it was going around in a circle, just <coughs> very simple mathematics. Um, and so that that big black lump in the middle there, it turns the object um, in a controlled way and dwells for a period of time to allow you to take your photographs. Okay, so, um, yeah, very precise alignment. Um, 
and it means that the software reconstructs the object very quickly and very reliably with very little error. Um, and the, the most important thing is that when there is an error, we can see the pink camera is out of alignment. Because of the precise geometry of the rig, you always know. If, the, if it's reconstructed it badly, you can tell straight away. And it doesn't put things out very often, but when it does, you can see. Um, and then you can really easily manually realign that one camera because you can see exactly where it belongs because the pattern is so obvious. Um, so this becomes very simple. Um, another thing that makes the captures possible with difficult objects and more efficient and more um, uh, accurate are these computer-coded targets. So um, as I said, the much more precise reconstruction of the models um, it gives you a, a really beautifully smooth um, surface texture um, and a very, very much more accurate form. So on the right is a, a generally available um, coded target sheet that um, anthropologists use in the field. So um, Samantha Porter and her colleagues developed this. Uh, so I was using that but also then playing around trying to get it to be better at its job because the object I'm trying to capture there, I wanted the hat band as well as the badge, and it was just impossible. Um, so I started off experimenting quite roughly with the targets, and then becoming much more ambitious, making these three-dimensional targets and finding out what the optimum geometry was for a 3D target, and the optimum scale for the size of the image. So there's a relationship between how many pixels the target must occupy um, in relation to the whole pixel space of the image. Um, so on the right, you can see my prototype <laughs> geometric target, which worked out for the camera angles I was using, 45, 90, 135, that's the best geometry for the target. And what it allows is that you can see on the far right there, if you know anything about photogrammetry, that's a sparse cloud and it's perfect. The geometry is absolutely perfect. So just straight off, you feed this target into a capture with an object that's impossible to get, and because um, the software sees the geometric target, it's happy and it processes everything and by accident you also get the impossible object. So um, on the right here you can see the software making the perfect ring of images. Uh, you can see the target is well defined. On the top right, the little yellow and red thing is my, um, oof, gr my blood grandfather's medal bar from the Second World War. Um, and the, the funny looking thing at the bottom is a dense cloud. So that's a point cloud of the geometric target, uh, which the software is happily processing. And it accidentally spits out the other bit as well. So here is um, the same uh, blood grandfather who was lost in the Second World War. He, he died in an airplane. Um, and this is one of two items that are left of him, uh, which is this little pin badge. Um, and again, it was a very reflective object. It was symmetrical, it was just impossible to capture. But if you feed the software, the target, and the object, you get both perfectly. So um, you can see that the, the not only does the geometry of the target help, but also those are computer coded. I mean, it's like um, Anthony was talking about with the, with the drawn codes. These are uh, what they call 12-bit computer codes. And each one of those is just a simple number that the computer can read. And you can see the little blue flags are the software automatically recognizing the center of that target, and so it helps it to reconstruct the three-dimensional object. So it's, it's all very simple stuff, um, but working out these, these kind of little tricks has, has made it possible to capture things that weren't supposed to be possible. Uh, so yeah, this is the metal uh, bar. It's, it's maybe 25 millimeters. It's very small. Uh, there's a, a simple early coded target object that I made, just a cube, and then I went on to develop better ones. Um, but the reason this object is so difficult, the, the textile, the, the uh, ribbon from the metal is easy. The little um, Tudor rose in the center is very reflective. It's very difficult to capture because it, it's a metal surface, so you can't use a circular polarizer because the metal reflective still goes through that, so that doesn't work. So you have to come up with another method to capture that surface. And where you see the bright of the metal, um, that in a, in a photogrammetry capture would just be a hole because it, it can't um, sort of reconstruct reflection. Um, in anthropology, they have a trick, which is they spray a texture 
onto these precious, um, you know, Neolithic artifacts, and then they clean it off again. I can't do that with these objects because they're made of textile and they're very precious, and I also want to, to see um, the absolute uh, material qualities of them. I want these to be like um, sort of digital found objects that are forensically accurate. Um, so I can't do that, so I have to come up with something else. So the solution, oops, sorry, <laughs> I didn't translate that one. I thought I got them all. Um, yes, yeah, so, so lighting, exposure, uh, depth of field, the lighting has to be very low intensity, it has to be indirect, and it has to be very diffuse. So what you see on the right looks very bright, but in reality it's very, very dark in there for photography. So um, in order to, to do this, to get these digital images, you need a very long exposure, um, and you, need, um, you, you end up with this very shallow depth of field, which is no good, because photogrammetry only really works with very, very good focus and excellent contrast. So, Big challenge. So um, I began experimenting with what um, I referred to before as focus bracketing. So taking a series of images from an identical position at different focal depths, and it's, it's beyond macro. It's tiny, tiny, tiny steps, like one little click on the autofocus. Um, and to begin with, I experimented with reconstructing that stack of focal depths in Agisoft, in the photogrammetry software. And it worked. So you just chuck in hundreds and hundreds of pictures and it manages to make a little stack of each of the pictures. It knows exactly where they are. It stacks them all up. Um, you can see on the right is a line of one camera position. And on the left is the ring. It's, a, you know, it's just a cropped picture, but that's the ring around the object from which the three-dimensional object would be reconstructed. And so this was the first kind of successful um, version. This is the little tiny, the, what they call the miniature wings that the pilots have um, on their uniform. Um, this is my father's naval wings, um, and this wasn't bad. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but it wasn't bad. But that was just three focal depths. That was all for that one badge. Uh, three rings of images, 24 images per ring. So not much data, and already a pretty good model. So I was encouraged. <laughs> um, and then the next level of development was to get much more technical about the focus bracketing and the focus stacking. So again, it was imperative that I use software um, that uh, that the college had, so I'm using Helicon Focus to, to stack the images. But then I also wanted to um, automate the process because it was becoming quite um, you know, laborious. So uh, I worked out a way that I could um, tether the camera um, to the focus uh, stacking software. Uh, and then I reprogrammed the motion controller again to sync up with uh, this software called Helicon Remote, which again is standard. Uh, photographic software, so that using time-lapse on the motion controller and time-lapse on the Helicon remote, they speak to each other. So I literally do one click per ring, and it automatically does the whole job, which is amazing. So uh, digital objects, they are this good. They're straight out the back. This is with no cleanup or anything. This is just straight out of the photogrammetry uh, into Rhino for uh, looking at. Um, I wanted to be able to get this level of proximity to see the qualities of these very worn out objects that have been in wars. Um, and then I wanted also to be able to play around with them in virtual reality. So this is Unity uh, with one of the badges inside. Uh, and again, this is a 1.5 million polygon model straight into Unity. No problem. <laughs> this is pretty weird. Um, and also, I, I'm also using photogrammetry to do metrology. I'm, I'm taking photogrammetry really boring objects so that I can reverse engineer them to redesign equipment. I have another thing on the go with, a, with an optical measuring stage using the same DSLRs to do very precise, not quite microscopic, but um, macroscopic measurement to scale objects. Um, I'm using it to output things. So this is the, um, one of the targets in production using G-code and CNC machines, machine tools. Um, and these principles are transferable across everybody's solutions. So a, a kind of easy anthropologist rig. This is um, Thomas Flynn from Sketchfab. This is how he does it. Um, these are some of my early rigs, which are using lights that came out of a skip. So it doesn't have to be expensive, as long as you stick to the principles of the orthographic alignment. Um, and uh, using a rented ring light. So there's lots of ways of doing this. At the bottom there, you may recognize 
Um, the slide projector, which was my early motion controller, which cost nothing. Um, and then I've gone on to develop much more sophisticated environments and rigs. Uh, but you can do it on a budget. So the slide projector, I just did some maths to work out the divisions. <laughs> just use that as the motion controller because it just came out of the bin. And you can buy relatively cheap photo 360 turntables. Um, other people are at this. They're spending a lot of money developing solutions which they then black box so you can't see how they work and then they sell them to you for a fortune. With my rig, anyone can build a version of it at any level. Um, and yeah, this is uh, Factor Marte making a, a kind of rapid head capture. Obviously for things that move, it's more difficult, but I'm only trying to capture things that don't move. Um, but I'm also working on a rig for larger objects that are flexible, because obviously if you put something on a turntable, it might change its shape as it moves. So this is a, a fixed object rotating camera rig, again using standard photographic components. Most of this was either out of the bin or off eBay for a few quid. Um, and so it makes a kind of a, a regular rotation around that center stand, um, just using these, these uh, fantastic um, naturalist tripod called bent, bo bent bolt tripods. It's First World War technology, and it's amazing because uh, it can do all of this. So I'm now trying to do larger captures in the field using this kind of equipment. Est-ce qu'il y aurait des questions pour euh, nos chercheurs euh, CSM En tout cas, merci d'être resté jusqu'au bout. C'était long, mais euh, ça vous fait comprendre aussi que les écoles anglaises fonctionnent 24 heures sur 24 et qu'il n'y a pas d'étudiants fonctionnalisés qui s'en vont euh, un peu plus rapidement que les autres. Voilà. Donc, est-ce qu'il y a des questions Non Il y a une autre présentation à l'extérieur maintenant, Michel. Je crois que c'est une bonne idée si on, euh, on va aller à l'extérieur pour voir la prochaine chose qui passe euh, avec la publication, l'édition de l'école en fait. Et puis, euh, il est le, du vin Oui, il est du vin aussi. Hein, je, je crois vous avez, vous avez vraiment gagné ça. Bon, merci hein, à tous. <rire>